<sighs> so you know, this week I was worried because I didn't know what to make a video about. Luckily, Stefan Molyneux, you do not disappoint. Um, so thank you for giving me something to talk about. This is the last time I talk about the guy, I swear. Uh, so pretty much what he did was on Friday or Saturday, he came up with a video where he was arguing with someone on his channel about his own theory of literary criticism that he uses to review movies and books and stuff. And the, the caller was arguing with him and telling him that it was just, you know, theory, uh, his theory didn't make sense. And Stefan Molyneux, of course, didn't understand. And I feel like I have the need. So, yeah, for me, I have the need to, of course, dissect it and rip it apart. Because honestly, Molyneux's theory of literary criticism is the stupidest thing he believes in. 100% the stupidest thing. It's worse than the libertarianism stuff, it's worse than the anarchism, it's worse than the everything. You know, all that other stuff, I, I have two huge videos where I talk about that. This is worse than that, by far. Okay, because I can understand that other stuff. Okay, I can understand why someone might be deluded into uh, accepting libertarianism and why someone would be, begin to hate the state and statism and, and taxation and all that stuff. You know, th there's... Uh, there's, I can see how the, 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 the logical, where the logical threads come from. This stuff, however, is just insane. It's, it's just insane, especially from someone who is a writer, supposedly, who has creative potential, who I know has creative potential, uh, to, to believe, to have such a backwards, you know, uh, view of interpreting work is beyond me. And, and for me, aesthetics and interpreting art is like the most important thing in the world, which is why I have to talk about this. Uh, right, so I guess I should explain what it is for those of you who don't know. For those of you who don't know, Steph's theory, theory of literary criticism, if you could even call it that, is basically the idea that if something is magic in a story, if it's a fictional story, if it's uh, a fantasy story, and there's magic, then the magic is always a metaphor for madness. It doesn't matter if it was intended to be a metaphor for madness, doesn't matter if the writer wanted it to be a metaphor for madness, doesn't matter if the work is better off if you don't interpret it as madness, it is still a metaphor for madness just because. Right? Uh, this is actually how I found Steph's channel was I found a video where he was talking about Harry Potter with this interpretation, and I watched it, and I was just sort of... I, I was confused at first, and I was actually really uncomfortable because his interpretation was just so backwards that I didn't agree, right? And then recently he came up with another video uh, called The Truth About Frozen, where he did the same thing for the cartoon Frozen by Disney, and he used the exact same rhetoric, and it's just, again, it's it's just nonsense, right? So. You know, watching that video, I was I was pulling my hair out because it was just so frustrating, right? All of this stuff is usually found in his uh, Truth About playlist on his channel, which, by the way, I just want to say is a stupid name for a playlist because it, it reeks of intellectual egoism to, to the nth degree. First of all, you're not even talking... Like, when you're doing the Truth About Frozen, you're not talking about art. You're not talking about aesthetics. You're talking about... The truth, right? It's the truth about, but 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 Frozen is is a work of art. How does it? How does it? It doesn't have an attribute of truth to it. Like if I'm talking about reality, then there's like the truth about rocks or the truth about you know people or something. The truth about animals. Okay, I'm not going to say the truth about a work of fiction where you're analyzing its quality, right? You're not you're not you're not trying to like unless what he's doing is trying to pierce the 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 state of mind of the author because that's not it I know he's not doing that he, he's he's literally telling you what he thinks of the work he's telling you how good he thinks it is based on this interpretation well quality is not dependent on truth quality is its own value if you've watched my morality equation video you would know well I mean that's what I say in that video I say it's you know the, there's the truth virtue and then there's like other virtues and then there's the art virtue which is a separate one right so I just, I don't like that name t to begin with. 
Yeah, but let's actually, okay, let's actually, I'm going to jump right in as to why I watched this video as to why, um, this entire thing is retarded, as why this entire interpretation is retarded, why it's fucking retarded. I have no other way to call it, I'm sorry, but it's incredibly stupid. Uh, for one, it doesn't follow logically. He tried to show in the video that it does follow logic, like, deductively. It doesn't follow deductively from anything. He's like, reality doesn't follow the laws of physics, sorry, uh, reality doesn't follow the laws of magic, ergo, magic and stories is madness. Like, what? What? <laughs> I don't have to explain why those why the, the the conclusion does not follow from the from the premise, but we know that Molyneux is not new to, to concluding things to, to concluding things improperly, but that does not follow. Okay, if the magic doesn't follow from the laws of physics doesn't mean that it, it, it follows from madness. Maybe it follows from laws of physics you're not familiar with, or maybe it follows from laws of physics, you just don't know how because it's not explained. Whatever. I don't need to explain it to you pe you people. Okay, you're educated. You can understand why this does not follow deductively. All right. So, so okay. There's two big reasons why, two big reasons why this interpretation is fucking retarded. Okay. Number one is it's, it, it's incredibly, incredibly imprecise. Like it's completely imprecise. The idea that something is possible or impossible, magic or non-magic. He says overt magic in the video, which I know what he means by overt magic, but the idea is still very imprecise. And this is kind of a theme with Molyneux. We know that he's imprecise about stuff. I mentioned in the UPB video that he's imprecise about the definition of the nap and about aggression, and that's definitely imprecise. I mean, I guess the problem with the guy is that he thinks he thinks the world is just so simple and categorical that you can easily put it into these non-intersecting categories and everything's going to fit and work easily, but it's not because the world is chaotic and deterministic and, and, and not not quite so easy to separate into non-intersecting categories that way. At least in term at least if you're using words like possible or not possible or aggression and stuff. You know, you know, these these sort of uh morality, these ethically heavy words or or morally heavy words, they don't they're not easy to um separate into non-intersecting sets. Anyway. Right. So I mentioned the entire idea is incredibly imprecise. It, it pretty much rests on this entire idea of, of uh, possibility. Okay, magic is impossible. So, therefore, yeah, you know. I mean, again, the first critique towards this I could say is, this, well, how do you know magic is impossible? Maybe there's laws of physics that allow for something like magic to work. You don't know. They're, they could be there. So it's not impossible, right off the bat. It's not strictly impossible. Second of all, he mentions that if it's not possible in reality, then it's happening in the mind. Then it's still not impossible if it's happening in the mind, right? Like, if it's happening in the mind, it's not impossible, uh, just by definition. That's, this is just a semantic claim. Like, don't use the word impossible if it's not actually impossible. And then we run into the very hairy area of how do you know that it's impossible or not? Like, legitimately, in the world, how do you know that it's impossible or not? And on what basis are things in stories possible slash impossible? Because that's very not easy to, that, that, that's not easy, that's not easy to explain. Um, I just have a note here, because like five minutes into the video, he, he just, he, he basically says, you know, he says that um, the, there's stories based in these worlds that are impossible, right? Worlds that are impossible. He used, I quoted that, you know, he uses that phrase specifically. What does it mean for world to be impossible as opposed to a possible world, right? Like, is it, does that mean that you can somehow come up with laws of physics that the world follows? Does that, is that what it means for the world to be possible? Or does it have to be in our world? Or does it have to be in a world like our world? Because here's what happens you know, it's reasoning like this where I can tell that he has absolutely no clue what he's talking about and has never actually put in much thought in, into classifying worlds, so to speak, that he starts saying into worlds that are impossible. What's a possible world? You haven't defined a possible world, now you're talking about impossible world. As far as I know, the only impossible world is a world where there's like a, con 
a contradiction or something doesn't logically follow. You know, a world where you divide by zero, so to speak, that's a world that's impossible. Everything else up for grabs, right? Um, so I guess, so I, okay, I guess I'm going to get to my little, uh, my, my um, diagram, right? I brought this thing out here on purpose. So, okay, imagine that the universe consists of two particles, an X particle and a Y particle. I'm not sure how well you guys could see that. It's good enough, okay. X, Y, all right? And this particle has one attribute. Pos these two particles have one attribute, position. They don't interact, they don't move, they don't do anything, they just have position. Well then, this vector, U, is maps, gives you the position of one particle and the position of the other, is a possible universe that can exist with those two particles, right? This U is a universe. You know, here it's represented as a 2D vector. Now, if you're mathematically savvy, you of course realize that our universe has many, many particles and many more variables besides positions, so it wouldn't actually be in 2D as a plane, it would be some sort of multi-dimensional crazy-ass configuration with like a billion particles and a billion different variables, and it would be in, in like, the dimension would be a lot larger than three, it would be like dimension a billion or something, you know? Besides the point, this is just a visual diagram, okay? Now pretend this U is our universe. Our universe. And now let me ask you a question. Does possible mean that something is in this U? Does possible mean that it coincides with... Uh, d d does possible mean that the story being told coincides with this vector U? So to speak, that it tells you know, it, it tells, obviously this vector changes with time because the universe changes and grows with time, you know, maybe it grows outward, maybe it rotates, whatever. Suppose that, uh, so suppose that a story tells you, you know, it's something that changes with time, and suppose that the story coincides perfectly with the path that this vector u takes, the path that the universe takes, right? then that is obviously possible, right? Then, then that story is possible. In fact, that story is not only possible, it is strictly existing, it is strictly real, because it actually does or did happen, right? All right, now if you're with me so far, now I'm going to ask you another question. When is it that a... Uh, at what point is something that we write down on paper possible in that sense. At what point is something that we write down on paper, whether it be fiction, non-fiction, anything, part of our universe? As in, when does it actually accurately, perfectly describe something that happens in our universe? When does that happen? I'm going to give you a second, because the answer is never. Never when you actually write anything down are you accurately representing our universe, right? Let's explain why. This is actually the big, this is the big crux of my argument, is that this, this, this notion of possibility is so imprecise that it doesn't apply just to fantasy. It applies to everything, okay? Let's, let's draw a wind back from fantasy. Let's go to science fiction. Now, supposedly stuff there is scientifically possible, right? Only sometimes they stretch the imagination and sometimes you have people doing superhuman things, right? That, that things that could not actually work, right? Like Superman, for instance, or maybe not even Superman, but maybe it's something like, I don't know, something similar enough, but it, it's supposed to be based in science, but it's science that doesn't exist yet, right? Or science that may not even exist. Is that possible or not? Do you apply Molyneux's interpretation to science fiction in that case? Do you, do you apply it to something like The Matrix or something like Star Trek? Things that are obviously possible, right? Well with an asterisk, everything that happens in those movies isn't exactly possible with the laws of physics in play, but the technology that allows for things to occur may occur at one point in our universe. Do you discard those universes as well, even though it could be possible in a sense? All right, let's draw ourselves back. Let's draw the barrier back one more step. What if we're not talking about science fiction? What if we're just talking about action movies and, and you know that, that Hollywood comes out with? Are they possible? 
they happen in our universe or a universe very much like ours they you know they, they exhibit a lot of the same physical laws but they also don't like people get shot and just live or, or you know people are able to fight and do incredible stunts and and all these ridiculous things I mean people could do that in real life but it's usually coordinated and and um, less stressful and you know real life isn't as action-packed as movies sometimes so you know these movies that are action-packed are they possible in a sense even if a person in them does something that is impossible right because if they're even slightly impossible the idea is you should apply Molyneux's interpretation right you have to say oh well this is just madness this is just madness going on inside the mind of some character right do you have to do that even if it's slightly impossible? You know, how do you measure how possible it is? Maybe something within the action sequence that they filmed happens but it's not act but it's not strictly physically possible with the laws of physics in play, you know, given the mass of the earth, the mass of the people involved, the the forces, the air pressure, whatever. Maybe maybe you can show and calculate that it's not strictly possible. What happens then? You know, do you have to discard the entire story as madness, even though 99% of the thing is completely 100% possible and true? Okay? What then? Like, that's a huge problem. I, I wouldn't know how uh, Molyneux solves that. Or is that just a flaw? Is it just a flaw when something is impossible, but in a movie that's supposed to be possible? Alright? Let's draw back again. What if there's no action, all the physics is completely 100% possible, but the characters aren't people that exist in real life? For example, for example, I can write a story about a guy called Jack. Alright, is that story possible? Because Jack doesn't actually exist. No matter how much I want him to, he doesn't exist. Even if everything that, that he does, supposedly you can imagine a person called Jack on the planet Earth doing that exact same stuff doesn't mean that Jack is a real person. So literally I'm talking out of my ass. There is no Jack, there is no uh, possible, there is no life for him. None of this happens. Literally I made it up. In fact, for it to work, we have to be somewhere else on this plane. We have to be like down here or, or like up here. Or maybe we're in the 3D and we're actually going like out of the board, you know, towards the camera there. Right? You know, because this is another universe. This is another universe. Because for Jack to exist, right, for Jack to exist in you, you know, the particles have to be arranged differently because the universe is deterministic and at some point, not counting quantum mechanics obviously, but the universe has to have something within the universe's timeline has to have worked differently. You know, the particles needed to be arranged differently for Jack to come into existence and for Jack to do the things he did. Maybe they needed to be different from the very beginning at the origin or they became different at some point in time due to like quantum mechanical effects. I don't know, I don't care. The point is, no matter what I write down, if it's a fictional story, it's not possible, right? Because it's not in our universe. So what does possible mean? Okay, does possible just mean, oh, the, the universe just sits on this plane, okay, does, or it sits on, you know, a generalized plane of like a billion dimensions to represent all the particles in the universe? At, what, what does possible mean? It, it, like, it's only when you leave the plane that it stops being possible, it's only, it's only po not possible when we start inventing new laws of physics? Because, you know, inventing new laws of physics is one thing because... But what fictional stories do a lot of is they don't invent new laws of physics, they just invent new particles that weren't there before. They, they create mass, right, where it wasn't, right? For Jack to exist, there need to be particles that have the masses that they need to have for Jack to be a person, which means you're literally breaking the law of conservation of mass and energy, aren't you? Just by insisting that Jack exists. And isn't that breaking the laws of physics? Isn't that impossible? You, I mean, the, the point is, you see the kind of crazy, twisted nonsense you get into by saying that, oh, it has to be possible to not be madness in the interpretation of the work? Ugh. Let's keep going, because it actually gets worse, okay? I mentioned this is for fiction. What if I'm writing nonfiction? What if I'm writing something about World War II? Is that possible? No, it's not. Because I'm not accurately depicting what happened in World War II. I'm writing a summary. To accurately depict what happened in World War II, I need to construct one of these guys. 
You know, I need to build an entire universe with particles and simulate World War II happening. Then I accurately told you what happened in World War II. This, like, just writing it down on paper, that's a summary. That's, that's a summarization. That's my best guess as to what happened in World War II or some other historic period. It is not the reality of what happened there, right? It is not the reality, okay? If we're talking about the reality, what happens in reality, because Molyneux kept talking about, oh, well, what happens in reality? The only stuff that happens in reality is stuff that's already happened, but that's stuff we can never actually write about or, or think about or talk about. Because anytime we discuss it, we are always summarizing. We are always taking the gist or the most important details. We are never, we are never simulating the entire thing. Okay? That's the strict definition of reality. Right? You can't simulate an entire universe, you know, you can't you can't have an entire universe without building an entire universe out of particles, right? And since we're not doing that when we write nonfiction, we're still talking about something that is strictly not possible in the sense, right? Because we're talking about something that we are we are um, approximating. Okay? It, it gets even worse than that. Okay? Draw it back again. Whenever you do physics, whenever I do stuff like this, you know, when, whenever you do, like, physical experiments or stuff, no, no, sorry, not experiments, whenever you're doing, uh, you, you're solving a problem in physics, you're talking about, well, what if there's particles in this configuration, or particles doing this, or there's a mass on a spring, you know, in, in a heat bath, traveling at 0.9c, whatever, you know, whenever there's stuff like that happening, that stuff is also not possible, strictly by this definition, right? It's not possible, because the world isn't like that. The world doesn't have masses on a spring in a vacuum, all right? Whenever physicists start approximating or, or talking about particles in physics, they always approximate. They always assume you're in a vacuum. They always assume there's like, there's nothing, air pressure doesn't affect the system or anything. They, they assume there's just you know, there's just the electromagnetic force in play, or, or they usually ignore gravity sometimes. If it's like a problem in electromagnetism or something, they, they, ignore, they ignore all the stuff they don't care about to simplify the problem. This is how you solve problems in physics, okay? If you go to university and you actually start solving physical problems, they are always approximations of reality. They are never reality itself. And so, they are not possible. So, the point is, the best thing you can do is you can come up with vectors that are like this and like that and somewhere like that. You can come up with vectors that are arbitrarily close to you but not exactly touching you. Actually, they could even be touching you but they can't coincide with you along its entire path uh, through time, right? Because u changes as a function of time, right? The point is you can only, you can only approach the thing asymptotically. You can't actually talk about reality, right? We can talk about reality. This video, this is not me talking about reality. This is me approximating reality. Every time I do anything or, or talk about anything, anytime I say I'm talking about reality, I'm literally just approximating reality. I'm not actually telling you what's true about reality. The only stuff, I can, the only stuff I'm not approximating when I talk about it is math, right? Math is, is pure. Math does not get approximated. Math is actually 100% true. Unless you're like a mathematical realist or something. I, I don't want to get into that, but the point is possible and impossible are not well-defined notions. Alright? I can approximate you. I cannot reach you. And so any universe you write about will always be near you. Now, assuming that this plane represents different configurations of particles, you can assume that you know, reality-based fiction, or basic, you know, fiction that occurs on planet Earth with people from planet Earth, you know, in modern times or past times, is basically some vector on this plane. You can assume that, right? You can assume that without loss of generality because all, all, the only thing you're changing in that situation from you is you're just rearranging the particles so you can have characters that you want, like Jack, and you can t tell a story about Jack and what he does, right? So, you know, fantasy and science fiction is when you leave the plane and you go into like a 3D or 4D or ND space and, and you start introducing new laws of physics and magical laws of physics. That's the, that's the actual interpretation of this that you're supposed to have. Now, um, I just want to check something. It was 10 minutes in. Right. Okay, so here's another argument. The, the person who was talking to him in the video, uh, around 10 minutes in, they said, okay, well... If you're talking about Frozen, and here's a universe that is not possible because, 
you know, you have uh, psh, fairies and shit, and you have uh, magic, then he says, well, why not discard the entire story? And um, instead of just discarding the magic and saying it's madness and leaving the rest, right? So this gets us into in a whole other area is at what point do you stop, at what point do you say what is real in the story and what isn't real? Because if the story itself is impossible by virtue of the fact that there's magic which can't occur via the laws of physics, then it's incredibly difficult to say. It's, it's literally not possible. <laughs> ironic there. It's literally impossible to say at what point do you draw the line and say this is madness, everything else is okay. All right, because he does this in the video, okay? Kings, queens, whatever you see in the story, that's all possible, but Elsa creating her ice magic, that's not possible. Okay, and yet somehow when he talks about Frozen in The Truth About Frozen, he also mentions Olaf, you know, the snowman guy, who's a creature made out of magic, but he says that Olaf represents the beta male uh, of, what's her name, Anna, the other chick, and he says, Olaf is just some beta male she has in her harem. Uh, because the whole point of it was like some feminist crap, right? And I'm thinking with this, well, that wait, that contradicts the other interpretation you just said. Everything that Elsa produces with her magic is just madness, but that includes Olaf, because she made him with her magic, so how can he be a real person that Anna interacts with if he's mad? Like, it's... It doesn't make any fucking sense, okay? It doesn't make any sense, okay? Olaf is not real in one interpretation and real in the other. They contradict. What else needs to be said, okay? So that's the point. Like, at what point do you start discarding the magic, stop discarding the magic and leave what's what's there, right? Like, if it's, if it's just an action movie and there's, like, action scenes happening, but the action scenes aren't strictly possible because they contradict physics to an extent, do you discard, like... Is is what happened in the magic? Is what happened in the action scene just like the, the the interpretation that someone within the action scene had because the the adrenaline was pumping and they weren't clear of of mind, clear of head when when the the action scene happened, or is are they just completely insane and everything is just madness, right? I mean, I guess the problem is is that there's not many. Um, there's not many stories, there's not many works of fiction that sort of cross the, 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 the lines or, or brush the lines very closely. They're usually on opposite ends of the spectra. You either have hard fantasy or like hard reality-based fiction, never something that's really close in between, right? Furthermore, what if you have a story where the magic is so, like, has almost no involvement, like Game of Thrones, what about that? Game of Thrones has almost no magic in it. I mean, that's not true, the, the setting has plenty of it, but the story up to the third book has almost no magic, okay? And none of it, literally none of the story relies on magic to even exist. All of it literally follows from just the characters' behaviors and their personalities and just the state of the world. So, what, what is magic in that universe? Who's, whose mind is the magic going through in that universe? Right? It's like, it's not easy to tell via this interpretation. And if you if you have to discard the entire universe because one part of it is magic, then you have to discard everything that happens in Game of Thrones, even though most of it doesn't even rely on magic. And it's bizarre because if if magic is has such a small involvement in the story of Game of Thrones, then then it's like then it's like, why do you even... Oh God, I lost my train of thought just there. If the story of Game of Thrones does not rely on magic too much, then... Anyway. Oh, wait, here's another thought experiment. What if, what if there is no magic in the setting, but it's still a world that doesn't exist, right? Like, it's another planet, and there's people there, and let's say they don't even speak English, just to make this easy, and this is a story about them. But there's no magic, they just fight with sticks and stones, there's no overt magic. Does that, is that a world that is not possible? Is that also something that's just madness, or is that, or, or does that uh, merit a different interpretation? Again, it's like, it's, it's, it's not obvious with Steph, like, none of this stuff is obvious, because he doesn't have, he doesn't have it categorized as well as he thinks he does, and it's just so frustrating to watch. All right, with Game of Thrones, you have to abandon the entire story because it is magic, or reinterpret it if, 
It's right. You have to abandon the entire story if there's magic in it, or you have to reinterpret it. But here's the thing. If you reinterpret Game of Thrones because there's magic in it, it literally won't change at all. It, like, basically will stay completely 100% the same, other than the whole dragons thing. So what then? Like, what happens then? Are the dragons in Game of Thrones just just uh, Daenerys' delusion as to what... Uh, D delusion, uh, delusions of her grandeur or something like that. Like, it's so bizarre. It, it's, it's also bizarre when the characters in this setting acknowledge that the character who wields magic is magical, or acknowledge that magic and fantasy creatures exist. Like, how does that get interpreted? If everyone acknowledges it, are they all just crazy, or, or, or do they all, um, are they all, like, with Harry Potter, it's easy, because with Harry Potter, he's just at a mental hospital. Yeah, it's easy there, but it's not easy with something like Game of Thrones. Like, like, how is the existence of the dra of Daenerys' dragons acknowledged halfway across the world in Westeros in King's Landing? How does that add up, right? Her dragons exist, and people halfway across the world believe that her dragons exist. Or do they just accept that she's insane? Because not only do they believe that the dragons exist, but they believe that she is... They believe that she's a threat because of them, right? They don't believe she's a threat just because she's a, she exists. They believe she's a threat because she has dragons. Although Steph might make some argument that they believe she's a threat because she's crazy and they, they're just afraid of her in general. Whatever. I, like, I don't want to get into it. The point is you see the problems. Okay? You know, honestly, Game of Thrones is a setting that doesn't even change much if you assume magic is madness. But still. All right. Okay, so what happens next in the video is he pretty much, I don't know how this even happened, I wasn't totally paying attention, but he pretty much starts ranting on libertarianism again uh, at around 10 minutes in, and then they kind of derail, and I have no fucking clue how, how you even managed to get that to happen, and it derails up until 32 minutes in, where Molyneux says, impossibilities cannot occur in the world, therefore it must be happening in the mind. Okay. So it's not happening in the world, therefore it's happening in the mind. Well, the mind is part of the world, so it is happening in the world. But the strict, what he means is, you know, physics can be different in the mind than it can in the world. Sure. Sure. That is true. But what if there's another explanation for it? Like, what if there's, an, what if there's a scientific explanation for it? Like Elsa's snow magic. What if, what if? All of that is actually scientifically possible, and it is. Imagine it's not Elsa doing it, imagine there's nanobots. There's, there's millions and millions of nanobots that can, I don't know, they have the energy to uh, alter matter at a molecular level and make it colder. Now that's scientifically possible, that's, you know, that, that's technology, right? It's possible. It, it doesn't exist yet in today's society, but it, it will eventually once nanotechnology, you know, gets up and running and gets really crazy. You know, we're going to have nanobots, we're going to have the ability to alter things at the molecular level, maybe just at will. And that's basically what she does. She just doesn't know that it's nanobots. Maybe there's nanobots that are, maybe she has a neural interface in her mind and, and the nanobots are receive instructions from it, or the, the neural interface interprets brain signals and sends instructions to the nanobots to create ice whenever Elsa is upset or something. Excuse me. So it is possible, right? Maybe that's the truth. Maybe that's, or maybe the entire thing is somehow simulated by, by an external force. Maybe there's people with technology that are creating the ice and making it think that it's Elsa who's doing it, but they have insane technology so they can make it happen, right? That's possible, right? It's not explained, you know, it's not probable. It is possible, though, all right? What then? Do you still discard the universe and just say it's madness? I mean, I would say in that case, it's probably a flaw that it's not explained if that was the intention, but, uh, my point is you can't just say that it's not, not, strictly not possible. Any magic, any overt magic can be explained technologically, right? It can. You, you can literally, I'm just going to say, I'm saying that in absolute sense. Any magic, any of it, any magic in any fiction anywhere can be explained, sorry, can be explained technologically. Including lightsabers, including the One Ring, including Harry Potter magic, everything, right? Yeah.
speaking of Lord, speaking of the One Ring, this gets even more fucked up if we start looking at uh, universes that are incredibly well developed, where magic is an integral part of the world, right? Like the Elder Scrolls video game series, like Lord of the Rings, like Mistborn, like oh I don't even know, not Harry Potter. Harry Potter is actually quite silly, but Lord of the Rings is a definite one. You know, you can't just say, oh, well, the magic is just madness. Who, who's madness? Okay? You know, first of all, magic doesn't even have that big of a part to play in Lord of the Rings. Not like every day there's magical creatures and stuff, but the magic, right? Like, again, if I say if it's just some other planet where people are fighting with sticks and stones and things you know to work with physics, why isn't it not physically possible? You know, I mean, I guarantee if there was a story like that, I mean, if there was a story like that, that would be like the perfect counterexample to, to Molyneux's interpretation. Of course, then he'd say, oh yeah, well, this planet clearly doesn't exist, or we don't know it to exist, therefore, by the interpretation, this is all just madness. But if you're going to do that, because we don't know it to exist, or it doesn't exist, then I can make the same argument for a story about Jack, or a story about the world about World War II, because again, they just approximate you, they get arbitrarily close, they don't actually coincide with the thing everywhere, so... Who, who knows, right? But let's go back to Lord of the Rings, okay? Yeah, sure, there's magic in Lord of the Rings, but it literally permeates the setting, so you... Saying that... Saying that magic is madness literally tears the entire story apart. If the magic is just going on in somebody's head, you now need to write, like, essay upon essay to actually explain how everything else in Lord of the Rings would be interpreted, right? There's no other way to do it, right? Like, the One Ring. The One Ring is a magical item, right? Whose madness is the One Ring? Is the One Ring an actual ring, or is it just completely a figment of somebody's imagination? Is it just madness, okay? Because if it is, whose madness? Is it Frodo's madness? Because that's the easy thing to say, right? It's Frodo's madness, obviously. But... Frodo doesn't even have the ring for a lot of the story, right? Right? Well, I mean, if you've read Tolkien, if you know his mythology, you know that Frodo doesn't actually have the ring. You know that the ring actually precedes Frodo. The ring exists before Frodo's even born. Hell, Bilbo has the ring in The Hobbit. And the ring exists before that, too. Gollum has the ring. And before that, the ring goes through that entire arc in the Second Age when Sauron creates it. So, I mean, whose mind is this happening in? All right? I mean, at best, you could say this is all happening in J.R.R. Tolkien's mind, because he came up with it, but that's a trivial interpretation of the work of art. It doesn't actually tell you anything about the quality. Whose mind does it happen? Is it Gandalf's mind? Well, I mean, sure, but, but the Gandalf doesn't have the ring at all. He never even touches the thing, so how could it be his mind? Like, it's just, it's just fucked up. You, there's literally no way to interpret Lord of the Rings um, in, in a way that makes sense and is satisfying to the intellect with using... Molyneux's interpretation, with using Molyneux's bullshit, magic as madness belief. There's literally no way to do it, okay? I challenge anyone, anyone, anyone on planet Earth to fucking try to interpret Lord of the Rings with Molyneux's, with, with, with Molyneux's uh, theory and, and make it make sense and explain it, okay? You will fail. You will fail a million times over. It cannot be done. It cannot be done because Lord of the Rings is so gargantuan a piece of art. And the fact that Molyneux even claims this about stuff like Lord of the Rings is proof that he doesn't even know what he's talking about, okay? There's no way he's read Tolkien in this case. I've probably read more fantasy than him in this case because I know a fantasy series that take themselves super seriously, okay? Tolkien is one of them. Tolkien's entire discography for fuck's sake, okay? So you can possibly, like, the, if if all of the magic in Lord of the Rings is somehow madness, you have to, you have to write an entire novel to explain what everything else is, or how this doesn't contradict anything that's in the story. I mean, hell, Molyneux contradicts himself when talking about Frozen for fuck's sake, and Frozen is like the simplest story in existence. He contradicts himself when he talks about Olaf, right? Like I already mentioned. I mean, sure, th th this Molyneux, this theory is appealing when you're talking about really basic, primitive, easy stories like Frozen, or even Harry Potter, where it's all kind of, eh. But even then, you run into problems, right? And even then, he's run into problems, alright? So it's just, it, it just doesn't make any fucking sense, is the bottom line of it. It just doesn't make sense, <sighs> is what I'm gonna say. Right. So 36 minutes in, uh, the video is about to end pretty much. 
Wait, what was the 32 minute thing again? Yeah. Oh, that's the one thing I actually forgot to mention. He says it's not happening in the world. Sorry. So it's happening in the mind. If it's happening in the mind, it can happen in the world. Let me explain that. Okay. From the, if it happens in the mind, it can happen in the world. Again, technologically speaking. If it can be imagined, it can be created. Like I fly in my dreams. I can fly in reality assuming that, I don't know, I'm in a plane or assuming that I have the technology to let me fly. Even if I don't realize that there's technology helping me fly, I could still fly. Again, maybe there's nanobots that are carrying me up into the air. Technology has very few boundaries, I just want to say. Like once we have, once we have molecular, molecular assembly figured out, magic will be possible for all intents and purposes. Hell, there's shit we can do today that if we showed it to people in the past, they'd be like, oh, psh, that's magic, man, you're magical. But we're not, right? So, I mean, if it can happen in the mind, you can make it happen in reality with the laws of physics. You just need to work a little. You just need to work a little hard and eventually it'll work. Of course, you're going to know how it works, and it won't be, it'll look like avert magic, it won't be avert magic, but that's the point. Maybe all magic is not avert magic. And anyway, in 36 minutes in, the caller pretty much makes the final argument, which is the argument I started with, which is that this doesn't follow deductively, which is that you cannot say, Psh, magic is, you know, magic does not occur in the world, avert magic is not like this, therefore all magic in fiction is just happening in someone's mind. You cannot make that logical leap is what the guy was saying and he was saying how maybe you can imagine these universes that have an alternate physics where magic can exist. That's the basic thing I started with, right? You have an alternate physics sitting in some dimension that's greater than four, some crazy billion dimension universe where you have different laws of physics than our own. And that plane of exist, that, that multiverse, right? This is a multiverse, right? That multiverse can have a universe that has a fantasy setting in it or has a fantasy like, you know, that, that, that has fantasy elements or has magic. This is possible. This is conceivable to the mind. You can justify it mathematically. And to this, Molyneux pretty much said, <sighs> Molyneux pretty much ignored the guy's argument and just said, oh, it sounded like you were making a logical argument, but then you f drove right off a cliff, so I have to move on to the next caller. Bye now. And that was it. And people are surprised why I don't want to call in and argue with him. But yeah, that's the basic idea. In fact, about this multiverse thing, it's actually easier to justify a fantasy universe than a non than a fictional universe because with a fantasy universe all you have to do is find the right dimension and it works and the dimension here the dimensions represent laws of physics right so if you're in like some crazy dimension you can have some crazy amount of lo number of laws of physics and these laws of physics can allow magic to work Right, and all you have to do is find the right dimension, and you're guaranteed of finding a universe within that dimension, a vector in that dimension that coincides with the story you want to tell. If you're doing reality-based fiction, you are restricted to this plane, this plane, right? And you are restricted, and not only that, but you have to find a perfect line. You have to find the perfect vector here that coincides with what you want to tell, because it doesn't coincide with, you know, reality as... You know, most writers naively think, we think, oh, I'm just writing about Jack. Sure, that's that's possible. They don't concern themselves with this justifying it realistically. I'm not saying that writers have to do this, by the way. I'm just saying that if, if Molyneux's entire model is that we should start looking at reality based on what's possible or not, well, this is what I'm doing as well. This is what I'm doing here. If you're writing a fictional story that could happen, could happen in reality, like it's Charles Dickens or, or I don't know... Who, who else do I have? Roald Dahl, um, William Fox. I'm just looking at the books I have around. If you have reality-based fiction, you have to find some vector on this plane that coincides with the story. You know, some vector on this plane where the particles are just right, just configured just perfectly to allow for your story to work, right? And you have to do this because you have to differentiate it from the universe that we are part of, the... the the real universe that we live in. 
So your work is cut out for you. It's, it's, it's impossible to do this because to, to find the right universe where the particles are arranged just right for Jack to exist and for the story of Jack to exist, you have to do some insane calculation and, and math to figure that out. Whereas if you're trying to come up with a fantasy universe, all you have to do is find the right dimension and you're guaranteed to have the right universe in that dimension, right? It's a lot easier. You don't have to find the right, you don't have to find the right universe that way because you just, all you need is the laws of physics. Right? Because you're not worried about, you know, contradictions and, and weird, like, causal things. That's besides the point. Forgive me if you didn't understand that. That's, it doesn't matter. Right, now I mentioned, I mentioned, sorry, I mentioned at the start that there's there two big reasons. I mean, uh, just before, one final note about this. The, this stuff is not, um, this reality-based approach towards fiction writing is something that I imagine most people ignore, and it's actually something that I usually don't worry about too much, at least not with Frozen, is because it doesn't really matter, but I do, okay, I do use it for my own work, my own writing, and in my own writing, I, I mean, I, I uh, what I use, is, it, my interpretive model is the uh, hyperverse, something I call the hyperverse model, which is just a generalized idea, uh, it's a, just a generalized version of the multiverse model, which I just presented to you guys. Just, that's all, I just want to mention that that's a thing that exists. I don't want to actually go into it because it's, uh, it's beyond the scope of this video. Anyway, I mentioned that there's two reasons why this is stupid as fuck, right? I already pointed out the first one, right? This is the second one now. Whoops. The second one. This is the bigger reason, by far, uh, the, if you ask me, all right, like, I don't have to, the interpretation being retarded is not enough. I mean, it's not, the interpretation being retarded is something, but that's not the big thing. It, you know, this actually kind of follows my UPB review, because at first, I, what I was saying about Wallen is that, oh, well, his definitions aren't precise. UPB is not precise, the non-aggression principle is not precise, blah, 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 and then at the end, I started saying, also, the non-aggression principle doesn't represent the values that I have. And that's basically the reasoning here as well. This model does not coincide with my values of fiction. It does not coincide with my values of art. It does not co coincide. You lose something by interpreting work of art this way. You lose something by doing what Molyneux does. And I'm going to get into why. The, the, the big reasoning, I mean, for me, this is a huge deal. You know, I care about this a lot more than libertarianism. This is like, this is my, my most favorite thing in the world, is, is art. I mean, if you look at some of my other videos, their titles, it's all about films and, and games and stuff. I, I love the hell out of literary criticism, right? So let's dive right in. My version of literary criticism is, is so different. It, 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 Molyneux's thing just flies right in the face of it. Okay, and it actually probably flies in the face of most people. My literary criticism isn't that extreme; it's just formalized, right? All right, so let's talk. Okay, let's talk about the elements of a story. There's there's a few basic elements to any story. Let's just say there's six, right, or five, five, six, whatever. I can't count. There's the setting, which we talked about here. You know, setting not being consistent with Molyneux's thing. There's the plot, right? There's the characters, you know, well, okay, I'll just summarize each one. Setting, that's like the world, the, the look of it, the appearance of it, the small nuances, the details, the plot, the main arc of what happens, the characters, the individuals in play, their consciousnesses, how they work, how they think. The themes, this is a big one, this is the philosophical ideas or the general ideas that the story talks about, focuses on, and explores. And the tone, the mood, which is a more of a vague one. It's it's like general feelings and emotions and thoughts that you carry that, that that the story brings towards you, while it's not necessarily focusing on. You could think of these as sort of auxiliary themes or sub themes. So it's five elements to a story. Now, the astute of you would have all really as these aren't mutually exclusive, and I agree they are not mutually exclusive. In fact. Okay, no, I don't want to get into that, but no, they are not mutually exclusive. Okay, they don't have to be. Let's just assume, for simplicity's sake, that they are to an extent, which maybe they are, for the purposes of this video, right? Now, I'm going to make a claim here, which is the basic principle axiom of my literary criticism is 
a criticism, okay, I don't call it a criticism, I call it an interpretation, all right, the correct interpretation of a work of art, the correct interpretation, the 100% interpretation that uh, I should have, that you should have, that everyone should have, is the best interpretation of that work of fiction, all right? Now, best in this case means specifically the highest, the one, the interpretation of it that yields the highest amount of quality possible. Uh, if quality is a function, mathematically, and a work of art is a whole bunch of sentences that, okay, well, just a whole work of art, just call it A, and then the quality is just a function Q, then we, we want... We, we, we want the max Q at A, right? I don't know if you can even see that, ah, whatever. We want the max Q at A, Q of A being the quality of the art via somebody's interpretation, and the maximum is the best one. Now, this is sort of, okay, this is, this is kind of vague and not exactly true because I haven't actually explained, okay, it's not arbitrarily the best, it can't just be arbitrarily high, right? That's actually an important point. It, it's, it's, it's the best interpretation to a point, it's the best interpretation assuming you don't contradict yourself or the story doesn't contradict itself or so far and, you know, so far and, um, in so far as there's nothing logically wrong with it, so to speak, like you can't, the story can't contradict itself and be the best, right? I mean, okay, I'm going to just actually step, take a step back. Imagine that a story is just a book, for simplicity's sake, is some finite number of sentences, right? A book can't have infinite number of sentences. It has some finite number of sentences, n, okay? Then, if something in one of these sentences contradicts something in another sentence or in some other group of sentences, then clearly the sentences, con if the sentences contradict one another, then the quality is not as high as it could be if they did not contradict one another, right? If they contradict, if the setting or the plot or the theme or something, right, you get the idea, okay? This quantity, Q of A, is measured specifically in terms of how much we appeal to the setting, the plot, the characters, the theme, and the mood, the tone, all right? The more setting detail there is, the higher the value of quality for setting, the more plot detail, the more interesting the plot is, the higher the detail for plot. The more character details there are, the more quality there is for characters, the higher the, the, the more interesting the theme, the higher the quality uh, amount you get for, for the higher thematic value, right? That's kind of an intuitive idea. So you get, um, right, so, 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 so you, you get, you, you want to maximize all of these, and if the story contradicts itself, you can't maximize them because something gets in the way of something else, all right? It's like an addition-subtraction process. If you add to something and then you have a contradiction, then you're subtracting. Like, you just can't, you can't maximize it. Now, obviously, some of you might think, well, if we're just looking for the best, then can't you just say arbitrarily that an interpretation is just, that, that, that this Q of A is just arbitrarily high and just the max is just infinity, right? Because if this is any number, and this is the max of any number, then this is just infinity. No, you can't do that because, well, first of all, nobody on this planet can actually say that the quality of something is infinitely high and be serious about it. If you say that, then you're lying or crazy, because in like infinite quality isn't something you can conceive of. Even if you look at a work of art and say, oh, I love this more than anything, this has infinite quality, it's not true because somebody else can come up with a better work of art and you're going to say, oh, well, that's better. Or, or you might think it's better without even realizing it. So you can't actually have infinite quality here. Just pointing that out in reality. Nobody can say that Q of A is infinite, that they would be lying if they did, right? But let's assume that they wouldn't be lying for a second. Infinite Q of A is still impossible because, um, because okay, I'm, I'm going to deconstruct it pretty much like, like this. Like, okay, A is just a, a book, right? So imagine A is just some finite number of sentences. A sentence is just, I'm going to use the symbol S. So you have S1, 
dot 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 sn. Right. Now, each of these sentences has finite quality, right? Right? Q of S I for any of these S's is going to be finite because because you can't have infinite quality with a sentence, right? Think about it. You can't actually have infinite quality with, for a sentence. Um, there is no thought or emotion or anything I can invoke with one sentence that will be infinitely, infinitely good. It can be good, it can be great, like, but it can't be infinitely high. And a sentence is supposed to appeal to those five things I mentioned before. Yep, the characters, the themes, the setting, etc. Um, for instance, I can say, oh, uh, Jack vociferously, no, uh, yelled, vociferously yelled at Michael. All right, that right there, okay, well, I'm adding to the plot because something is happening, right? I'm adding to the characters because I mention what Jack is doing to Michael, and I use the word vociferously, which tells us something about Jack's state of mind, and the fact that he's yelling, so it adds to the characters. Doesn't really add to the theme, necessarily, unless you have more context, so on and so forth. Okay, so each sentence adds something to each of those five things, and I mentioned you want to add to all of them. Now, of course, of course, those five things aren't mutually exclusive. Not only that, but the quality value for each individual sentence is not exclusive from the previous ones. Right? This is because things in literature need to be built up. The quality of a scene can be very high if it was built up properly by, you know, uh, previous scenes. If a scene just happens randomly, then it's not as good, right? Like, The Red Wedding in Game of Thrones is an incredibly powerful scene if, it was, if, if you build it up properly with all the previous scenes that happened. Just reading The Red Wedding by itself is not that interesting, okay? So... The, the quality of some, okay, whatever, the quality of SN depends on all the quality of all the other ones. SN is the last one, right? So the quality of these other, of the other one, it depends on the quality of the other ones. But the quality of the other ones is finite, right? And the quality function can't, can't, can't take, it, it, it's not allowed to take finite values and create infinite ones. That, I mean, that's just a restriction on Q that I already mentioned because you can't, Q of any S can't be infinite. Right? Q of the pre first S1 cannot be infinite. It, it isn't allowed to be. It cannot take just something that a sentence says and create infinitely, create infinite quality values from it. That's not how it works. Okay? So the quality of SN has to be finite as well. So the quality of all of them have to be finite. So the quality of the work overall is finite as well, by virtue of that fact. All right? Now, of course, you're thinking... You know, to, to, make, to, to make the quality of a story infinite, you have, the story has to be infinitely long, pretty much, or it has to have infinitely many themes, okay, which it can't do. But even if it did, okay, let's say a story has finitely many themes. Let's say a story has finitely many themes. The fact is, okay, what is a theme, actually? I should probably explain what a theme is. A theme is an idea, at the end of the day. A theme is, uh, a theme is... Yeah, it's, it's an idea. It's a philosophical idea, or not even a philosophical idea, just a general... Something to think about, really, is what, a, is what a, uh, an idea, what a theme is. And the goal of a story, at least that's my version I maintain, is the goal of a story is to just take a theme and construct a story around it. And then the whole point of the story is to appeal to the theme at every point. Now, many stories have multiple themes, and a theme can be anything. A theme can be very meta. A theme can be what, are, what is the point of stories in general. A theme can be how are stories constructed. Like, if you look at Stanley Parable video game, the, all the themes of the Stanley Parable are basically themes about games themselves, not or about stories and tropes themselves, rather than about uh, general things in reality or in society, right? So those are what I would call meta-themes. So theme is just an idea in that sense, and because these are all sentences of finite length, you can only appeal to one idea some finite amount, right? You can't have, I can't have finitely many words 
describe infinitely many ideas, right? That's not possible, and I can't have... So any story has finitely many themes right off the bat because of that. Because to describe every idea, I need infinitely many words, which I don't have. Second of all, even if a sentence or a series of sentences describe finitely many themes, the fact is, I can't appeal to each theme the same amount. There must be some theme I appeal to more than another. I can appeal to each, actually, wait, I can appeal to each one the same amount, but there's a finite amount, so it's still finite at the end of the day. Or I appeal to some one theme the most, because I use most of my sentences or most of my words and phrases to appeal to this theme, and I appeal less to the other themes. So because of that, we have some finite number of themes, and the, the quality value for each one is less and less, because there's the main theme and then the subsec and then the smaller themes and so it's a decreasing series and so it converges right the po the point is this thing doesn't have this thing q of a is never infinite never ever infinite that that was my point here to to, to say that this thing is well defined it's not it's never ever infinite for any story because for it to be infinite you would have to describe infinitely many things um yeah that's the point so what's the problem with the Molyneux interpretation here Right? I mean, Mai just said, you want to maximize Q of A, and you want to maximize your appeal to setting, which entails maximizing your appeal to the setting, the plot, the characters, the themes, etc. Now, this process is stimmied if there isn't that much setting detail, as in the story doesn't appeal much to the setting. I mean, you can interpret... Uh, right, oh, I didn't mention this thing. You can, in your interpretation... You can rectify differences between different sentences, but you can't add sentences. SN is all you have, right? It's only these sentences. You can't, you can't add anything else. So if the story doesn't actually describe the setting very well, and I, setting details aren't in any of these, you know, S, SN, then, um, then you're screwed. Then the story simply doesn't appeal to the setting that much, and that needs to be factored into Q of A, and therefore Q of A cannot be as high as it potentially could be, if the story did appeal to the setting, right? If the story doesn't really have an interesting plot, then that also gets factored in. If the story doesn't have too many characters, or the characters aren't well fleshed out or interesting, so on and so forth. If the story doesn't have, oh god my nose, if the story doesn't have many themes, or a very good mood, or so on and so forth. The whole, the whole point is, you, you are limited by how much can be said, and if not a lot is said, then Max Q of A is only some amount. But the point is, the point I'm making is, the reason I'm saying it has to be the max is because a story, you know, I probably don't even need this thing anymore. Yeah, you know, screw it, I don't need this thing anymore. Yeah. Just put it down like that. The point I'm making is, even though you're looking for the max, you can only, the max is only so high. And the reason it's the max is because if I'm looking um, if I'm looking at a story that has flaws, that has bad themes, for instance, or bad characters, or something that's very flawed about it, then I weigh that against possible themes it can have that are, that are good, or possible interpretations, or or possible themes. Yeah, that's basically it. You know, if themes are bad and the characters are bad and everything's bad, then I look for sentences, I look for an interpretation where the theme is better and the characters on the plot and the setting and all kind of fit together, you know, work together, are better developed, make more sense or just have a higher value of Q of A with this new theme and that becomes the actual interpretation rather than the interpretation, the previous one, where the quality wasn't so good. This is actually why... The other reason for this is I actually disagree with the notion that the quality of a work of art depends on the intention of what it was supposed to be about, right? The, the artist's decision on what it was supposed to be about. I disagree with that notion completely. You know, the artist does have a big say, but at the end of the day, I think it, uh, you know, if somebody has a better interpretation than the artist, if, if somebody looks at a book and comes up with some crazy way of interpreting it where the book seems the book is even more deep and more interesting and more complex than what the author had in mind then the quality of that book is higher than the supposed quality that the author would have suggested right that's just an aside anyway the point is 
What's the problem with Stefan Molyneux's interpretation? Okay? The problem is it doesn't do that. It doesn't take the max. Okay? Because it ignores themes. It ignores themes... Okay, well, here, let's just look at what it ignores. Okay? If magic is part of a setting, and let's say that that's important, then what is automatically lost? Well, whatever setting details come across from there being magic are lost. So, the story appeals to the setting less if magic is not allowed to exist. The plot. The plot is automatically less complex and less interesting. Why? Because you are removing the plot and coming up with an with, with an alternate plot that involves some mad character and their journey through madness. It is no longer about what is happening on the screen, it is no longer about what is happening on paper or what's happening there. It is a version that is less complex, right? It is, it's about something else, but, it's, but it is necessarily less complex than the plot that was there. I'll give you a minute to think about why that is, but the plot, the Stefan Molyneux plot of Frozen is less complicated, less complex, less fascinating than the actual plot of Frozen. Because you always, the reason for this is, is like it's obvious and intuitive to me, but the reasoning is whenever you sort of do what he does, whenever you sort of create, the, the whenever you suggest that the story is just a metaphor for something, you're automatically pulling back. Uh, on the details. You're automatically pulling away from what's there to a less detailed version. Because that's what a metaphor is, right? A metaphor is like it's a mapping from what something that we have to something else, but that something else is less detailed, right? Yeah, I mean, the metaphor is always going to be less detailed than, than what's actually written out in all the nuances and all the details. I can, write, I can talk about a rock and all its nuances and details and just say that, oh, this is a metaphor for a sponge or something. Like, I, it doesn't have to make sense, whatever. But the point is, I can, like, given that I'm not writing out all the details and, and literal nuances of the sponge, but the rock, then I don't have all of the nuances and... and details and facts and information about the sponge. Ergo, doing the metaphor thing decreases the complexity of my story. It's now about just a sponge that's kind of like a rock, but it's not actually like anything else, so it doesn't have any other tangible qualities other than it's kind of like a rock, all right? Uh, the rock, the story about the rock was fully developed. It had a rock, it had everything about the rock. It told us what the rock was like, what it looked like, what it felt like, so on and so forth. Molyneux's story about Frozen is like Frozen. It's kind of like Frozen, but at the end of the day, it's some weird story about a girl who's insane and who had parents who were kings and who had a sister who was uh, trying to save her from ice, her madness or something like that, and there was feminist themes and stuff. Right? You get, it's, it's, it's less vague. You don't have as much information when you do this metaphor thing. It's, it's always a pullback type of process, right? It's all, it always decreases, it, it, is, it strictly decreases the number of words and the number of sentences that describe the events, right? Inarguably, inarguably it does. A metaphor decreases the number of sentences that describe the events. And since it decreases the number of sentences, then the story becomes less complex because the complexity of the story depends on the number of sentences. Simple. What else do we have? Characters, right? Now, strangely enough, it does actually add to the characters because it suggests another layer to the character that we didn't think about necessarily that might not even be there if you just look at the story. Um, if you look at the story at its sort of face value, right? But, um... The, the thing is, is you have to weigh how much, to, for this max QA thing to work, you have to weigh that the, the amount of setting value and plot value lost by doing, by, by doing the metaphor thing, how much value is added to the character thing. I would say not enough in general. I would say in general it's very difficult to come up with a story where by taking the metaphor, t taking it as a metaphor for something else, you lose value for setting in plot for setting in plot, but you gain enough value for characters that it over that it that it um makes up for what is lost. Just say that's almost impossible. Fourth thing, let's forget about tone or mood, it doesn't matter. The fourth thing, last thing, themes. 
you definitely lose out on themes. You definitely lose out on themes because you can't take everything on face value. The theme of a story generally depends on how it's taken on face value, okay? The theme of something like Lord of the Rings and, and all the themes of greed and, and all that stuff, they depend... They depend that you interpret the story at face value. If you do the metaphor thing, if the reality is somehow different, then you, you, you can't look at the themes the same way, right? The thing, like, the plot is, is, is done in such a way that the theme makes sense, that the idea of the story, that the story has a point, and, it, and the story sort of uses these events to make a point. But if the events told aren't the literal events that happen, because of Molyneux's weird interpretation thing, then the theme is detracted from for the same reason, because now we have these new alternate metaphor events that are supposed to add to a new theme. And that new theme always takes away. And that's why I don't agree with um, Molyneux's interpretation of Frozen, even though that the whole feminist thing he said, may ha he may have a point about that whole feminist shit about Frozen. He might have a point, but I still don't agree, because it doesn't matter. Because Frozen is a much better work of art if you interpret it this way. If you interpret it in the way that it's just a story about two sisters who loved each other and stuff. Like, whatever. Right? The theme is much stronger that way. That's the basic principle. You know? You, you lose theme and plot if you do the metaphor thing. Right? You, you, because you're, you're, you're removing the theme that's there to come up with a meta-theme. And that meta-theme isn't as good. That, that's just it. Right, the meta theme because it, it it's based on a simpler story. It's based on a metaphor story, which is less complex than a real story, and it's based on a meta theme, which is less complex than a real theme. Because again, like the to a certain theme, um, like how well you can e evoke a theme in a story, kind of does depend on how much information you have and how many sentences you have, right? Like, if I have more word, more information, at my, if I can use more sentences and more words, then I can give you a better idea of, of a story and a theme. If you say that it's all just a metaphor, then somehow, all of a sudden, I have fewer words and fewer, <clears throat> less information to use to evoke a, uh, a theme, which is why the theme loses value. And it also, it's a completely different theme when you do the metaphor thing, because you can't interpret it the same, you can't interpret the plot the same way. Like, if the theme of a story is, um, if a theme of a story is, 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 if the theme of a story is A, and the plot is B, and A implies B, then when you do the metaphor, you get B prime. There's no telling that A implies B prime, right? Something else can imply B prime. It doesn't even matter. The point is, it's just, it, it's crazy. You, you, you cannot, you, you lose theme completely by, uh, doing Molyneux's thing. That's pretty much it. That's all I wanted to say. And my camera's running out of juice, so I have to stop here. But yeah, that's the big principle. The, the, the correct interpretation of art, I just want to say, is the max A, max QA interpretation, taking the best interpretation, and interpreting it at all as part of some elaborate multiverse where magic is allowed to exist. That's how you get the best amount of quality. Molyneux's wrong, that's it. Thanks for watching.